Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel and if you are new here, I am Mariana and I interview the brightest minds of physical therapy. So if you want to increase your knowledge, start right now by subscribing to this channel, clicking on the bell so you don't miss anything, give us a thumbs up and share this video with friends and colleagues that you think it would also benefit. Today our guest is Brian Wee and he has his private practice, Motion Stability, since 2008 and he's going to talk about motion analysis, his new book that it's called Unresolved, which is about unresolved pain, and much more. I hope you enjoy the show. Hi, Brian. Welcome to PT Pro Talk. How are you today? Good. How are you? Thank you for having me today. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Excited for our conversation. Great. Uh, so let's jump right in. So could you tell us a little bit about yourself, your career, and how did you get to where you are right now? Yeah, um, so my name is Brian Yi. I'm a physical therapist uh, originally from California. I uh, graduated from uh, physical therapy with my master's in PT uh, in 1999 from Northwestern University in Chicago. Um, and went back to California uh, to work in California for three years uh, for Physiotherapy Associates, which is a larger uh, corporate outpatient orthopedic clinic there. Um, and I ended up going uh, in 2004, I uh, went back to get my master's in physiotherapy, which is basically equivalent to like a fellowship or residency degree or program at University of Queensland in Australia in 2004. Um, and basically it was um, basically a, a master's in manipulative therapy or basically chronic pain, uh, spine therapy, things like that. And I went there because when I was a uh, physical therapy tech or aid before I got into physical therapy school. Uh, my boss at the time, who was a group director for a physical therapy clinic, I think he took a year long sabbatical um, to go to Australia, to University of South Australia, to, to train with the likes of like, um, let me draw a blank of who he's basically all the clinical reason models, uh, Mayland. It is a man. He, he trained under Mayland's uh, philosophies and things like that. And uh, I asked him why he went to Australia. And he basically said, that's, that's the number one place to get trained. Uh, that's where all the best therapists are at. And I remember him coming back uh, from Australia that year. I was about to go to PT school. And I saw him treat for about two months. And I was astonished how good of a therapist he was after he came back from Australia. And uh, so I, I basically vowed to myself, after I got out of PT school, I'd go to Australia myself. Um, so after working three years in California, physiotherapy associates, I decided to go myself to Australia, uh, which is University of Queensland. Uh, I got to study with Lorimer Mosley, Gwendolyn Joel, Paul Hodges, uh, Deborah Fala, uh, Michelle Sterling, Bill Vecinzino, um, so a lot of the great uh, minds um, uh, at the time uh, to really understand research, clinical reasoning, pain sciences, motor control models. Um, and that was, that was earth shattering uh, of the clinical experience. Was really introduced to neurodynamics. That was one of my big loves there is understanding how nerves work. Um, and it was really neat to see um, nerves not being seen as like a special test or some kind of straight form test, but how nerves actually integrated with just general functional movement, uh, not only just pain or radiculopathies, but actually how it limited people's ability to bend or squat or throw a baseball. Uh, that was the one, one of the main things that highlights I really enjoyed understanding how nerves work in musculoskeletal function. Um, and then came back in 04, 05, uh, became a clinic director for Physiotherapy Associates in California. Uh, it was a buyout practice that they bought out uh, at the time, and they still me as a clinic director without management experience. Um, and when, I, when they put me in this clinic in Upland, California, I was the number five grossing clinic in the nation by revenue. I had 25 employees. I had 15 to 17 therapists working for me. Um, and it was, it was predominantly workers' comp in 04 and 05. And, um, the workers' comp bylaws changed then. Governor Schwarzenegger at the time changed the workers' comp reform laws there. Uh, we lost 60% of my business in a year, and I laid off uh, uh, people in a year, and uh, it was deemed as my fault that I couldn't keep the business up. <laughs> the workers' comp law changed so much that we just couldn't get enough business. So um, I lasted there about a year and a half. Um, was introduced to my wife at the time, where we were to my no wife, we were to a girl that started dating. She was in Atlanta. And so I moved out here for her in Atlanta, where I'm now, uh, and moved here in 05, 06. Uh, worked for three years at, a, uh, at Emory Sports Medicine, and then started my prior practice, which is called Motion Stability Physical Therapy, uh, in 2008. 
uh, with a dedication to start a business that was dedicated to uh, quality care, um, people willing to pay a higher a model, uh, a fee, that stuck by just in-network insurances, things like that. So we started out of network cash based business, one patient per hour model in 2008. Uh, and we, we partnered with a, um, a kind of, not partnered, but I, I put myself in a clinic, uh, not a physical therapy clinic, but a golf for foreign specialty clinic that uh, was sponsored by Nike Golf at the time. That we uh, had a golf for foreign uh, facility, 3D motion capture reality systems, things like that. We had golf trainers, we had physical trainers, we had stretch therapists, I was a physical therapist. So I was introduced to a golf clientele that uh, typically had a little more money, a little more affluent. Um, and who are willing to pay more money for quality care. Uh, we were able to grow that practice, uh, and by 2013, I had three therapists uh, out of network working together, um, and we decided to open a second entity in 2013 uh, that was an in-network insurance practice within the same model. So motion stability is kind of a banner model of two different options. Uh, one out of network, people want to pay a higher price model for higher quality care, and then a second practice that took in-network insurance uh, for people who couldn't afford it or conditions that didn't belong in our practice. So post-op surgical patients, ankle sprains, your, your typical acute strains. Uh, through my experience through Australia, I have a huge passion and heart for clinical mentorship. Uh, so I've, I've, we've basically partnered a lot with a lot of, a lot of local universities here in Atlanta, uh, primarily Mercer University, uh, where I've been able through this time in uh, 15 years I've been here helped start the residency program here, as well as the manual therapy fellowship at Mercer. Uh, so in our prior practice, we will have residents and fellows uh, in our practice. We've graduated, I think, six or seven residents, orthopedic residents uh, through our program, uh, through our clinic here, as well as graduated uh, three fellows uh, who are credentialed through AOMT. And we have one fellow in training right now as we speak. Uh, and our growth model moving forwards is to kind of have this LA in-network and out-of-network insurance option but within that, you can have the younger therapists in training, residents, mentors, the residents and fellows in mentorship models, including interns, be mentors in the network insurance model, uh, mentored by the senior level therapists who are more either post-residency trained or post-fellowship trained. Uh, so we've been in practice since 2008. Uh, we've been able to survive uh, through a stock market crash in 2008. We've been able to survive through a coronavirus a pandemic. Uh, we're busier now than we are ever. And it's been a blessing to actually have a practice to survive through two different uh, economic crises as well as health crises. <laughs> and we're still standing pat uh, for a quality care practice that patients are looking for uh, solutions, quality care time, advanced training people, um, you know, people can provide results as well as assessments. Um, and that's who we are. It's kind of, I've learned to kind of fight through that and uh, survive through <laughs> a lot of different conditions and just be committed to uh, being the best therapist I can, take care of my patients the best I can, and just survive on word of mouth referral uh, and results that we provide. Wow, what a great story. <laughs> it's just so much. So let's see. First of all, we are going to probably have another episode just to talk about the difference <laughs> between the business, That's out of network, in network. Yeah. yeah, because I'm very curious to talk about that, and I'm sure many PTs want to learn more about this topic as well. Um, in Australia, what happened in Australia? Everybody was there. It's Mackenzie, Mulligan, New Zealand, Australia, that area, Maitland. So I think it was a, a great place to be and a lot of great minds there. I, I just thought about the, um, what you sent me, the, that you showed up in the news, right? It was New York Times that oh, you had like a... Wall Street Journal. Wall Street Journal, sorry. So it was great that I'm gonna put on my on the notes so people can have an idea of uh, how you've been through this crisis and everything. And I think it's so amazing, and I'm so impressed that you're, you know, able to deal with all these uh, difficult situations. And I'm I'm so happy to hear that you're stronger than ever, like with the clinic um, full of patients. So that's great. Thank you. Uh, just just shows the the good work and that you provide and good good physical therapy that you provide to your clients so Thank that's you. amazing um and as you mentioned you study a lot of motion analysis right you said like the golf performance specialist moving links and all other techniques you use let me see the list here my 
I know you use dry needling, neurodynamics, manual therapy, um, fascial manipulation, movement links especially. So could you tell us a little bit about like all the techniques you use and especially about the movement analysis that I think it's very interesting. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, as I, I think there's so many different fields within physical therapy, right? But in outpatient orthopedics, especially like movement's got to be the key, right? If, if we don't, if we don't corner the market or be the specialist in, in how movement works, especially in pain related dysfunctions and, and whether it be chronic pain, uh, geriatric, older, you know, vestibular systems, but also in the high level performance, right? Um, if we don't, corner of the market and, and actually claim our stake in that market, especially from a pain injury uh, limitation standpoint, because there's, there's a lot of trainers and personal performance trainers who can do really great things as well. So that's not uh, knocking them at all in that regard, and chiropractors too, but uh, from a pain and disability limitation standpoint, if you don't analyze movement in that regard and understand how it works, um, I think we're losing a lot of what we are in that regard. So, you know, we don't want to be the post-surgical therapist who just bends these back and forth or knee replacement, although that's necessary, um, you know, the idea of how the whole body system works in movement um, and analyzing the movement is key. And then from there, you got to ask the question of, well, what's limiting that? What's causing that imbalance? What's causing that throwing, you know, the kinematic sequence to be off? What, you know, what, why is it hurt, you know, when you throw or swing a golf club or do ballet or, you know, do CrossFit? Um, so to break down that movement and to break down into components of why it's happening, uh, has been it's been fun because of my background. Actually, I, I I would never, I mean, even for my clinical training, I was never trained as a sports therapist per se. I was actually trained as a chronic pain therapist, which is ironic from Australia. Uh, even my University of Queensland program, we had two different kind of divisions in our class. We had the chronic pain manipulative therapist, and we had the sports therapist. And the sports therapist wanted to cover on field coverage, things like that. I, that wasn't me. I was actually trained to train a chronic pain therapist. So in chronic pain, you know, training, we looked at a lot of more contributing factors. Uh, and this is more Maitland-based clinical reasoning models of what's your contributing factors, what's driving it, right? So joint mobility, muscle control, neurodynamics, trigger points, fascia, all these different tissue pathologies, and just and then capture that into a movement assessment. Uh, so then all the years I've trained with, with um, I'm a big fan of Claire Frank with Movement Links. Uh, that's a California bias. Uh, she's been a conglomerate. A lot of different movement sciences from Florence Kendall to Yonda to Kolars to uh, a lot of different people. She's, she's assimilated a lot of different things to, together. Um, Michael Shacklock with neurodynamics, uh, Luigi Stecco, who's in Italy with uh, fascia manipulation, uh, dry needling uh, with um, um, uh, Jan Demerhalt and Myopane Seminars. That's kind of who I went training with. Uh, what I really appreciate about all the different disciplines I learned uh, from a manual hands on perspective was they always went back to movement, right? So you can needle something, but reassess it. You can, by movement, how they move differently. Could they raise their arm better? Not that they just feel better, but could they bend better, right? Uh, neurodynamics, nerve sliding dysfunctions, things like that. There no doubt relates to pain, but also the ability to have less pain, but also with better movement as well, better quality movement. So it's kind of neat to see you do a nerve glide, and all of a sudden they can raise their arm better. Um, not only if they had less paresthesias or ridiculous symptoms, but their quality of motion was better. And now they can swing a golf club better or um, throw a baseball better. And their kinematic sequence lined up with it. And I guess lastly, with my experience at, um, when I started my business at the Golf Performance Center, which I'm no longer part of, but uh, we were sponsored by Nike Golf. Um, they had a 3D capture motion reality system. So the golf pro would look at golf swing analysis and kinematic sequences and flip head angles and, and launch speeds and um, uh, angles of rotation of the hands and shoulders and hip and hip and shoulder, you know, turns and things like that. And be able to match that with what we know about the human body, uh, get the things that we know to get better out of pain, but also get the quality of motion better movement wise, and all of a sudden see them hit the ball farther. They're not only feeling better pain wise, but now they're hitting the ball five, 10 yards farther without changing anything. And they're, the, the golfer is astonished to see all this, holy smokes, like, I'm hitting the ball farther, I feel better, and I'm not having to work as hard. It's crazy. So it's kind of neat to see from a chronic pain standpoint to change these parameters, and all of a sudden they feel better, but also perform better too. So that, that, from a movement standpoint, going back to the question, uh, it's neat to understand the movement, but tied back into all the fundamental things we've done from uh, clinical reasoning, pain science, tissue pathology, and then match it to a better movement pattern.
which is really what yeah. a patient is. The patient's coming to see us for that reason, right? They don't like care if they have a trigger point. They care because they can't move. So you yeah. better understand that all, all it kind of together. So just one question that I was curious about the golf performance. So how did you do that? Like you analyzed through video, you recorded them, and then you analyzed. Uh, did you use any sensors? Did you have any special uh, technique or tool that you used? Yeah, so the, the beauty about working with a, you know, a coach or a performance coach is you know, they, they had the motion sensor reality, the 3D sensors on, on, the, on the wrist, the hands and elbows and head and stuff like that. And then so we had the whole three-dimensional room with camera systems that can actually visualize the golf swing. And if, if you visualize on a TV screen, you can spin the TV around and see this animated picture of the golfer from different angles, from up top, from down below, from face on, from back. And then it would match with different angles, with different uh, kinematic sequences, different velocities. Um, so I just sat there kind of passively for about a year and watched the golf pro talk golf because I, I play golf, but not, I've never claimed to be a golfer. Uh, I enjoy playing golf, but uh, to actually watch them describe the golf swing. And then what we would do right afterwards, we would physically assess them, joint motion, watch them gate, watch a gate, uh, watch them walk, um, take a medical history. We actually got written up um, in a medical journal. I think it was in orthopedic uh, magazine. I forget which one it was. We did a case study. One of my therapists did a case study and do our medical examination. Uh, we actually, the, the, the client who was a golfer had a rib pain. And through our subjective history, we took a medical history, right? That doesn't sound right. It turned out to be a medical a metastatic tumor that was misdiagnosed by the primary care doctor. And uh, so the, the patient was under in debt and uh, thankfulness for us to catch from our typical physical therapy medical screening subjective questionnaires. He had the classic yellow flag symptoms. Uh, and we sent it to the doctor and we found a managed act tumor that he was playing golf and didn't know. Uh, so it's kind of neat to be in that kind of, um, uh, you know, medical screening capacity as well as you know, physical assessment capacity. So through years of, of golf analysis, watching uh, my colleague, John Patterson, who's a top 100 golf uh, magazine instructor, uh, a couple of personal trainers, such as Billy Mitchell and Nick Garrity. It's a couple of guys I got to work with through golf performance trainers to talk this trifecta of performance training therapy, golf pro, mashed to a 3D mash motion reality system that objectively quantified the golf swing, uh, we were able to come with some, some great results. That was a lot of fun. We did that from 2008 to about 2015 together. That looks interesting. That's nice. Uh, I have a lot of friends that love golf, so I know they're going to love to hear about that. So now I know that you are going to release your book, your first book soon. <laughs> And so let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, what is the topic of the book and why did you decide to write it? Yeah, thank you for it. This is, the, the book is still, it's on its final leg. So I'm on my final like last draft. Um, we're hoping to have the book released uh, early next year, probably February is probably the, the estimated time. But the book title is called Unresolved. Uh, and in a visual depiction, the, the, there will be a parenthesis around the UN and then resolved would be the second word. So all one word is unresolved. Um, my clinic motion stability, we've, we've captured uh, kind of a market and unresolved pain. Um, we don't like to call it chronic pain. Um, I don't like to call it chronic pain. I don't like to call patients coming into chronic pain. I think that's you know, a lot of other comorbidities that I don't want, they don't, I don't think we need to fully discuss. Uh, I don't say don't want to discuss, but I think the idea of hope, the idea of trajectory, the sense of deliverance that we can actually get you somewhere, uh, this, the fact that there's still a sense of a, a victory through this, the idea of unresolved to, un, to resolving your pain is kind of in the way we've marketed ourselves. Um, so the, really the book title will be called Unresolved. Uh, and I just feel after, you know, 15, 20, I've been practicing 20 years now, um, after practicing 20 years and seeing multiple therapists and mentors and different training programs I've been through, uh, I just felt like I wanted to just write something that the general populace who've been struggling with uh, why their pain is still there and explaining from a, you know, like from a therapist perspective, I'll, I'll say that the book is written from a very clinical reasoning perspective written for a lay person. Uh, in simple terms, it's called clinical reasoning for dummies, basically, <laughs> which you don't call for dummies, but the idea of we're, we're narrowing it down of the idea of, of how your subjective history, how your objective examination all tie together and why your pain works there. Again, very based on Australian clinical reasoning approaches, um, and explaining that from a very lay layperson's uh, language. Uh, very written more from a story perspective, case studies, uh, user-friendly experiences uh, from patient examples, uh, tying it in with basic sciences of how pain works, 
basic pain sciences, what's a trigger point, other things, you know, neurodynamics, um, explain these things that dispel a lot of what people think just pain is from because they're herniated disc, their arthritis, their degeneration. And you very well know from a path anatomical model for that we're trained in PT school that, you know, we're trying to get away from the path anatomical model and look at more of the biopsychosocial models, things like that. So uh, it's, it's a book written from a very narrative-based story, base of case examples, broken down into clinical reasoning of subjective and objective um, examinations so that the patient may be empowered to know that the pain is not just from a single diagnosis. So I think that's very uh, interesting from the, the, the patient's point of view. Um, that's a question that we listen a lot, our patients, you know, asking. Um, so I think it's going to be interesting. So what do you think are the biggest components involved in unresolved pain? And what do you think needs to be changed? Components to unresolved pain? Um, you know, just from a societal standpoint, you know, from a patient perspective, you know, we talked about before, is, you know, everyone's fixed on a, especially in America, everyone's focused on a diagnosis, a test, an x-ray, an MRI. Uh, they're looking for that path and anatomical answer why their pain's there. That's, that's we got to dispel that first. So a strong clinical using therapist who understands, you know, the biopsychosocial model, understands uh, pain sciences. Uh, there's so much research on pain now, and I was really influenced by Laura Mira Mosley and David Butler's work. Uh, there's a lot of therapists in the U.S. now doing that kind of research as well. Uh, and, and really from there, you know, as, as a clinician, I, I, you know, as much as I've done a lot of different things, uh, I still, by heart, after 20 years, I'm still still feel called and still feel really rewarded being a clinical therapist, having huge empathy for patients who are in pain, uh, and be able to tell a story or a narrative that makes sense to that patient. I think that's the key. I think there's so much research out there. And there's almost so much stuff being written out there for patients to kind of, or even science and research about pain, how pain works. But I still feel like uh, the general society uh, and even clinicians as a whole probably can do better about trying to explain not just pain itself, like why pain hurts, but also why it's relevant to them specifically, the patient themselves. So uh, I think there's been a lot of great stuff uh, on pain itself, pain sciences, pain education. Um, but I think, uh, I think we can improve a little more on really delivering that to make it really personal and relevant to that specific patient we're talking to, which means we really need to know who the patient is, the sports they love, the motivation factors, what really is driving their pain, things like that. I think it's really get deep down of what, who they are as a person to figure out why, why they're doing what they're doing to cause pain. Outside of traumatic injury, you know, we get a lot of people who are runners and, you know, they run because their dad died of a heart attack when they're younger, so they're afraid to, you know, whatever. So they're motivating factors. What's fueling their fire? What's driving them? Not just this is what pain is. Um, so I think really digging, digging down to their story, uh, which is, you know, I'm not trying to promote my book in that regard but that's the book is you know really ties into like what what are you really doing in that regard why are you really driving yourself to do this because you know your pain's happening for these physical reasons but there's there's still a reason why you're doing this for yourself you know fear avoidance models why why are you not moving because you're afraid to things like that too so on the flip side too so uh, i think really you know understanding the pain sciences and then really delivering a strong message and clarity to the patient the individual patient so they can really understand that it relates to them specifically. Yeah, so I think it's kind of mixed with the next question I had, that like what, how we can help them. So I think you pretty much said like education, understand their history, the big picture, their, the reasons behind they do what they're doing. Um, any, anything else? Yeah, you, and then from there, just, you know, once you get that story down, you can get, take a proper history and then, you know, educate the patient properly, you still got to have the interventions and tools to deliver, right? So you can talk pain science, yeah. central pain processing, and all these different things. But if you don't have the tools to get them better, whether it be manipulation, dry needling, exercise therapy, whatever that person needs to get to their goals, uh, whether it be just be able to go for a walk, hold their child, play golf, go for a run, right? Play professional sports. If you don't understand where they're trying to get goal-wise, you guys still got to have the tools to get there. Um, so you got to have a multitude, multitude of, of clinical tricks in your, in your, up your sleeve to be able to get there because not, not, not one thing would be dry needling or nerve gliding or manipulation is going to get you there. I think most therapists know that. The more, more diverse portfolio you have in your clinical treatment uh, regimens, the better. And then you got to know when to use them, when not to. Uh, 
Um, you can't just get reliant on one system only. Uh, I think you gotta have a, a big diverse bag of tricks and know your clinical talent to know when to apply them, when not to. Yeah, so talking about that, how do you think that everything that you study and experience in your career helped you contribute to your view today? Yeah, um, you know, the one, the one valuable, invaluable lesson I learned in Australia was to have a clinical mentor stand there and watch me treat a patient. And my person might have a classic radicular symptom from a lumbar disc, right? And he'd say, okay, so based upon what your findings are, you know, what, what is it? And what's the diagnosis? I said, well, it's a herniated disc. And he said, well, why is that? And what other reasons could it be? What other diagnosis could it be? And so there's, you know, that phraseology of, of fra phrase of what they call metacognition, the idea of self-reflection, uh, was probably the probably most invaluable tools from a clinician standpoint, not necessarily like having love for neurodynamics or manipulation or motor control, but the ability to sit back and self-reflect of why did the patient not get better? Um, it's not just because the patient didn't do their exercises. What could have you've done as a therapist to do better, to encourage them or to motivate them to do their exercises better? Or if the patient got worse, right? What did you do? Maybe you manipulated them in the wrong place. Maybe your technique was off. Maybe you, you maybe it was a neurodynamic problem as opposed to a manipulation dysfunction, right? And so having that metacognition to look back and challenge yourself as a clinician to ask yourself, what could you've done better? Um, rather than the patient's not complying or the patient's got this problem, uh, but to put the onus on yourself as a clinician first to challenge yourself to become a better clinician so that the, the therapy can be more successful and the patient can, be, um, can receive more quality treatment. That's probably been the most um, beneficial thing I've learned. That I challenge uh, most, you know, I mean, a lot of times medicine as a whole, therapists, doctors, we, sometimes we get that kind of white coat, you know, phenomenon. We get this ego trip that we're you know higher than now. Now we're doctors of physical therapy, things like that. Uh, you got to check your ego out the door. Uh, if the patient doesn't get better, check yourself first. Uh, not say you're the problem, but to make sure you're not just you know casting that problem on someone else saying they're the problem. Uh, make sure you've done everything you possibly yourself you can do, uh, which means you got to keep learning because there's not one one solution. So the more things you can learn and then apply it to the patient and know when to apply it and know how to encourage the patient to keep pushing forward with it is really kind of the secret sauce in my mind to actually keep moving forward with your clinical skills. Yeah, I think it's like with all this background, as much as you go and study and learn new things, you, you improve your clinical reasoning, right? And then with your experience seeing a lot of patients, you probably start to differentiating better and like, oh, that's it, this is this. And, and I think just your, all the background that you have, it just adds up to that. Um, Let's go to our final questions. Okay. So do you have a favorite resource of information, any study papers, books, anything that you recommend? Yeah, when you asked that question, at least when you emailed me, that, um, I, I thought of two books. Um, one is uh, a good general orthopedic book for especially younger therapists looking for a broad background, just orthopedic dysfunctions related to rehab. Um, my colleague and friend, Derek Suecki in California, uh, uh, he and um, his colleague, I'm totally drawing a blank what her name is, um, wrote a book called Orthopedic Clinical Advisor. They called it the five-on-one textbook. Uh, great clinical reasoning background book. Uh, great in pain sciences. Uh, breaks down different body parts, uh, elbow, wrist, shoulder, back. Uh, a lot of um, baseline um, uh, research, um, uh, etiologies, uh, compounding factors, uh, clinical results. Great clinical book uh, that we uh, give to a lot of our interns as well as residents. Uh, they use it as a baseline book. Uh, I think one of, a little bit biased towards Australia in terms of Laura McMosley and David Butler's work, Explain Pain was, a, in my mind, a, a earth shattering book that came out uh, back in what, 04 or 05 uh, about how pain works that broke our, our perceptions of pain. Uh, surprisingly, actually, uh, Laura McMosley, at least in the US, got much more notable right around after about 2004, 2005. I didn't really know, really know who Laura McMosley was when I studied with him. Not knowing he's going to be this international you know, speaker and influencer in how we free pain and stuff. Yeah, so I wish I would have been wise to, to do more research with him when I was there. Uh, but his, his book uh, and David Butler's book, Explain Pain, was, was great. Uh, big fan of uh, Michael Shacklock's book on clinical neurodynamics. Uh, his clinical reasoning approach to neurodynamics was, was um, really foundational to dispel uh, the peripheral sensitization of nerves uh, because nerves get a lot of time, get a real mystical kind of. Um, 
perception of how neurons work, but it really is just another soft tissue. It's another connective tissue we should be dealing with. So I understand how the mechanics and physiology work. So I thank Michael Shacklock for his um, level-headed approach that fits the clinical reasoning model uh, and how neurons related to the musculoskeletal function, dysfunction. And then the one paper in terms of like research article, I used to be, when I was younger therapist, I knew the research articles in the back of my hand and quote, you know, David Butler's work and his work and Gwen Joel and all these different researchers doing it. I could, uh, but the one research article that really has, has resonated me too, that I even still now uh, reference, it was a 1999 article in May uh, in the, the journal Manual Therapy. It was a master class paper written by Toby Hall and Bob Elvey. It was titled Nerve Trunk Pain, uh, colon, uh, Physical Diagnosis and Treatment. Uh, that, was, that paper was introduced to me when I was in Australia in 2004. I still remember going, oh my goodness, like, and it basically talked about just physical ex examination and watch the way they bend, watch the way their arm. You know, if they bend, they all of a sudden they list, you know, to the left. They might have old restriction from a scarred down nerve from an old radiculopathy. And now when they, you know, cast to the left, that's not just because they have a herniated disc or they have some facet dysfunction. Their nerve might maybe less elastic and they have less, they have more scar tissue there. The nerve doesn't move. So they'll have adaptive shortening the way they move. And you might say it's a, you know, facet dysfunction when it's old residual nerve uh, related to scar down tissue from five years ago that no one can see on an MRI. Uh, I found that paper revelational to me because it tied in not just joint dysfunctions and herniated discs. And I know you're a McKinsey therapist, a bunch of back bends and things like that. There's so much more adaptive changes, um, comp compensatory patterns that happen uh, due to chronic pain, and those are things that cause the chronic pain to happen, or what we call unresolved pain. Um, so I found the paper really, really foundational, looking at the human body and physical assessment, tying in nerve-related dysfunctions. Uh, Shacklock has, you know, taken that step to a step farther, and then all the other different things, fascia, trigger points, movement dysfunctions, things like that, all tie in together. And well, a lot of resources. I'm going to make sure to put them down on the notes so everybody can check sure. that. And what would be the best advice you give to the clinicians that are starting their careers? Yeah, um, you know, I, I, I'm, as I mentioned before, my clinic, I'm, I'm a huge fan of mentorship. Um, I think you got to have, you know, people to stand there next to you and kind of watch patients, uh, watch you treat patients. Uh, you can take a bunch of iconic like, courses and certifications, and no doubt you need to do that. Uh, but mentorship, face-to-face uh, -face clinical progressions, watching someone who's a little more senior than you, give advice uh, and guidance to let you have metacognition moments where you can actually reflect, say, oh crap, like, like this is what I did wrong or this is what I did good uh, and this is what I could do better uh, is needed. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty old school still um, in terms of institutional training programs. Uh, you know, APTA and American Therapy has really pushed forward since I've graduated in 0405 with residency models and fellowships. Uh, so I'm a huge proponent of doing residencies and fellowships. Just make sure you find that residency and that fellowship that, that meet your needs. Make sure you have that mentor who stands next to you who will guide you through the process. Um, that might be through certification programs as well. So, uh, you know, I, I know the one um, deterrent of these residency and fellowship programs is a lot of the cost. You get paid less. You have these school, huge school loans to pay for. Um, so the math doesn't make sense. Um, but I would say the return investment, I mean, I had, I had to pay tuition to get mentored to go to Australia. I didn't get paid to be a fellow or resident, where I know in the US you're a resident fellow making X amount of thousands of dollars at a reduced cost. You're still getting paid to, to treat patients. I went to Australia, I had to save my money to pay someone to mentor me. So I'm kind of like, that's a, I don't get mad at them, but I get a little frustrated because they're like, you know, that's not worth it to me. You know, I got these school ends to pay for. I'm like, look, I mean, you know, if you put your money down and, and actually get mentored the right way, and it's it's the hugest return investment I ever had. And, and to pay the money I paid to go to Australia and not get paid and pay tuition, you know, that was probably a sixty to eighty thousand dollar swing on on that year. But I will say that was the largest return investment I did. I'm so glad I did it. Um, so I recognize a lot of people can't do that or afford to do that or are willing to do that. So we that's why we set up the residency models, the fellowship models. Um, I don't do a lot of the mentorship myself. I have therapists in my staff now that are, are huge believers of the education model. Uh, my colleague Deanna Camillo, who I who I'm uh, who works with me, uh, is 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 my fellowship director here. And we do a lot of mentorship stuff. She's amazing. I have other therapists who are, who are highly committed: Dara Shaw, Dustin Lee, Stephanie Lipinsay, uh, Cone, 
Akan, uh, as well as Tom and Chris, those are my six therapists, we're all committed to clinical mentoring, uh, learning from each other as well. So it's not just, hey, I'm better than you, I'm gonna teach you what to do, uh, but have the humility to learn from others. So my, my therapist, uh, I learned so much from them too. So just having open mind to learn, uh, put yourself into institutional uh, mentorship programs would be, would, be, uh, would be recommended. You are one of the many that told me that on this uh, advice, get a mentor. I interviewed Michael Shekalak before too, and then he said the same thing, get a mentor, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Michael's great. Uh, uh, yeah. See him again, tell him I said hello. <laughs> and final question, what personal qualities or abilities that you think are important to become a successful physical therapist? Yeah, uh, just kind of, I guess, reiterating some stuff we talked about before. Uh, you know, I still call myself a, a true clinician. I'd love to treat my patients after 20 years. Uh, a lot of people burn out, right? And a lot of it is based upon you got to have proper relative time work balance. Um, I have three kids to support, so I, I mean, my motivation financially to keep going, I keep going, but I still love what I do. Um, uh, huge empathy for seeing people in pain. I hurt when I see people who have not got the answers they're looking for or truly looking for answers, who try to get surgeries and interventions, even seeing physical therapists who can't get better elsewhere and then seeing the reason why. Uh, it's, it's gratifying to see them uh, find answers. Uh, it, trivial for me uh, to um, challenge myself to figure out why they're doing, why they're having pain, uh, putting, putting them in a cookie cutter uh, model. They have trigger points or um, they have a back dysfunction based on a category, right? So to have the, the, the mind challenge to, to ask yourself why they're having these problems uh, keeps me motivated. Uh, so that comes with strong clinical reasoning, understanding pain sciences, being able to integrate that all together to provide a proper diagnosis from a rehab, movement-based diagnosis, provide the interventions. Um, and then from there, uh, customer service. Um, my dad uh, had a pharmacy for 40 years. My brother took it over as a pharmacist. Uh, so I have half pharmacists, half physical therapists in my family. Uh, we come from a small business perspective. Uh, my, my dad's, now my brother's pharmacy, he's pharmacy in Long Beach, California, uh, has been going for 50 years now, um, strictly on customer service. And they, um, they have engaged their clients when they walk in the door. They make every client feel like they're home. Um, that, you know, my dad would say, if you worked for a standard pharmacy like a CVS, you would quit a long time ago. Uh, it was the patient engagement. It was getting relationships to develop with these customers, kids get to know who their kids are, the, the traumas they've been through, the hardships they've been through, and have the empathy to, to meet them where they're at as a person outside of their pain and see them physically get better and potentially even see them get their life better too because they're in less pain and also in their marriage gets better or their not just golf, not just tennis, but their, their other things, their life get better because of the impact we've had. Huge reward, right? And, and I know you, you have seen that as well. Um, so even now, after 20, 22 years of doing this, I still find reward in that. Um, so, you know, find that call, find that, that call as a clinician and knowing that you are in a key position to turn people's lives around, not only from a pain and, and rehab standpoint, um, I think is that reward that, that is kind of dangle in the care that keeps you get going. Because there's a lot of factors, whether it be insurance reimbursements, uh, Medicare, you know, this 9% cut we're facing, authorizations, you know, other, other competition we're facing. Uh, it just keeps you motivated to keep one patient at a time. Yeah. I think that's the, the biggest thing. I think in our um, profession is the reward, just the, um, to know that you're able to help someone that's suffering. I think that's, it has no price. And for people that want to know more information about you or your clinic, how they can find it. Thank you for asking that. Uh, right now, our, our clinic website is motionstability.com. Uh, that's our clinic website. Um, I am in the midst of developing a website for my book. It'll probably, the domain site will probably be brianyept.com. That's the reserved domain site. Uh, I haven't developed that website yet, but that by next, early next year, we'll have more, uh, probably a personal profile page or my professional page. Uh, but right now you can find me at motionsdubai.com. Uh, happy to email you. If you want to email me, email me questions, I'm, I'm very accessible. If you want to email me at brian, uh, B-R-I-A-N at motionstability.com. So Brian at motionsdubai.com. Uh, if you want to email me there, uh, happy to field any questions, any follow-up questions that regard, you know, mentorship, uh, clinical questions, uh, business questions um, in terms of startup stuff, um, leadership. I have a huge passion for leadership and mentorship in that regard. So uh, leadership, clinical mentorship, business stuff, any questions in those regards, happy to uh, field those questions as well as the book um, coming in, in early next year. 
Yeah, that was my next question. Early next year. So let us know when that happens. So you can I put like on the our podcast. Oh, that's so, no, I'd be honored. Yeah. I, I I really struggle talking about myself in that regard. So I, you know, promoting myself, you know, I, I appreciate you reaching out to me. That this is uh, I, I wasn't looking for this one. So for you to take the time to reach out to me and look at my profile and be intrigued by it, I'm honored by it. I'm humbled by it. Um, you know, I'm not trying to self promote myself. Although this becomes a self promotion, so I can't say it's not. Uh, but I'm not trying to self promote myself in that regard. Uh, word of mouth referral and just people being, you know touched and influenced or um, uh, changed by the work we do and you know the work you do as well will be will be life-changing so you know you're doing the same thing in that regard so thank you for uh, your initiative especially I didn't realize you started this podcast uh, due to pandemic times and that's neat to see you be innovative right and that, that's that's our call in these troubling times how can you be think outside the box how can you be innovative how can you kind of get ahead of the curb um, so you're doing the same thing and I know people who are listening to this podcast will probably be doing the same thing and, and whatever dimension or lane they go in. It may not be a book, may not be a podcast, might not be a clinic, it might be a different way. So I encourage uh, people to continue to find ways to innovate, uh, to keep swimming up the stream and, and find ways to kind of survive and thrive as well, not to survive, but to actually continue to thrive in the, in the way that you're called to do so. Yeah, I think you've been done an amazing job and deserves to be shared. So uh, we are here just to share information and let more people know and hopefully more patients will know about your book. So um, you just keep in touch. We're gonna update once you, you publish. And I really appreciate you taking the time to share all your journey and experience with us today. Thank you. Thank you, I really appreciate the time. Thank you so much.